for example, concerns a much more controversial issue than our eating habits. It concerns our sexual and romantic and uh, family relations. What kind of family relations and sexual habits did our ancestors have 40 and 50 and 60,000 years ago? The world of, uh, of people who lived 20,000 or 40,000 years ago is that it was not a single world or a unified world, but rather many different worlds. The most notable characteristic of hunter-gatherers of hunter-gatherer societies is how different they are uh, one from the other. People often imagine as if all hunter-gatherer societies have exactly the same basic social structure, the same beliefs, the same religions, the same values and norms. But this is a complete mistake. There is and was an amazing variety of social patterns, beliefs, values and norms among uh, different groups of hunter-gatherers. Some scholars believe that the ancient foragers, our ancestors, did not live like people think that, that everybody lived in, monogam in monogamous relationships and nuclear families. So some scholars say no. Back, uh, back in those days, 40, 50,000 years ago, people uh, lived in communes and not in monogamous nuclear families. What does it mean that they lived in communes? Well, at any given time, uh, a woman could have had relations, sexual and romantic relations, with several men. And similarly, a man could have had, either at the same time or one after the other, relations with several women. Uh, and there was no concept of marriage for life in a nuclear family. Now, this does not mean that they were, were engaged in all the time in promiscuous sex and one night stands. Uh, because you have to remember that these people lived in very small and intimate communities in which everybody knew everybody else. So it was not like jumping from a bed of one stranger to the bed of another stranger, but jumping from the bed of somebody you know very well to the bed of somebody else that you know very, very well. And in fact, uh, back then, people knew the other members of their band much better in some ways than people today know their, spies, know, know their, their spouses. For example, if you lived in a band of people 50,000 years ago, you had a chance to see how the other behave in very extreme conditions, which today few husbands and wives get the chance to see how their spouse reacts, say, during a mammoth hunt or when a lion uh, uh, starts chasing you. So few husbands know what the wives would actually do if a lion starts chasing him. But 50,000 years ago, people knew that. They encountered such conditions, not every day, but from time to time. So in, 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 many, in many ways, people knew each other much more deeply than even married couples today. And therefore, don't imagine that the ancient communes were like this alienated, promiscuous sex that sometimes happens uh, uh, in the modern world. It was something uh, uh, very different. Now, another thing <coughs> that a certain group, not all scholars agree on it, just a certain group of scholars who believe that people used to live together in communes, they also argue that parenthood was very different from uh, uh, parenthood today. Today, at least according to traditional family values, every child has one father and one mother that raise him or her uh, with their combined effort. But, argued, uh, uh, argues an influential uh, group of scholars, back before the agricultural revolution, 20,000 or 50,000 years ago, children were not raised by couples children were raised by the entire tribe. Of course, the mother was very important. She, she suckled them and she took the best care of them. But all the other adults, or at least some of the other adults in the commune, they also help, helped taking care. And the entire commune basically raised together all the children. Now, what they also argue, these scholars, is that the concept of fatherhood, which is very central 
for the modern family or the traditional family was actually non-existent in the original, in the original communes because people could never be sure, men could never be sure whether a child is theirs or of somebody else because there was no nuclear families and uh, uh, monogamous marriages. And this is not just idle speculations because anthrop anthropologists have actually found uh, some societies, some tribes today who believe in, the con in a different concept of fatherhood in what is known as collective fatherhood. This means, according to the belief of such people, that a child could have more than one father. Uh, they argue that, that the belief of, of those tribes is that when a child is growing in the womb of a woman, it is nourished by the sperm, by the semen of men, but not just of one man, but it can be nourished by the sperm of many men, just as an apple tree can be nourished by the, rain, by the water coming from different clouds, not, not just one cloud, so a child growing in the womb of a mother can be nourished by the sperm of more than one man. And it may sound very silly to you, but take into account that until the 19th or 20th century, with modern medicine and modern emb embryology and genetics, people did not have any firm evidence that a child must always be born just from one sperm cell and one egg cell of one man and one woman. So there was no clear evidence that this notion of collective fatherhood is impossible. And women who live or lived back then in such societies that believed in collective fatherhood, when a woman was pregnant, she took care, if she was a good mother, to have sex during her pregnancy, not just with one man, but to have sex with many men so that her, the child that is growing in her womb would receive good qualities from all kinds of men, not just from the best hunter, but also from the man who is best in communicating with the spirits, and from the man who is best in producing knives and spear points, and from the man who is the best lover. Why not have my child have the qualities of all these men? Why just one man? So according to one school of thoughts, it's important to realize it's not all scientists who believe this theory, it's just one, uh, one school of thought. Uh, people, tens of thousands of, year, of, of years ago, they were used to living in uh, communes, not in nuclear families, and they were used to raising children together, the entire commune together, and not just by a, a pair uh, of, uh, of parents, a, a mother and a father. And according to this, this idea, people are naturally inclined to live in communes and uh, to practice collective parenthood or collective fatherhood. Uh, and if this is true, say this school of evolutionary psychologists, then many of the problems which we experience today in our romantic and sexual and family lives are the result of a mismatch between our biological program and the actual conditions of our life today. We are programmed, uh, have been programmed tens of thousands of years ago to live in these communes and yet now everybody expects us to live in a, a nuclear family, just two parents raising the children together. And argue these scholars all the, the problems of high rates of divorce, of infidelity between couples, of all kinds of psychological difficulties and traumas of children, they are all the result of the fact that we are forcing ourselves to live in ways which are simply incompatible with our biological program. Now, as I said, this is not the truth. It is just a theory about uh, about, huma about humankind and about history and about the way that people tens of thousands of years ago lived. Many scholars vehemently reject everything I said in the last few minutes. They vehemently reject this entire idea, fantasy, of, the, of uh, an, uh, an original commune and collective fatherhood and things like that. They insist that the nuclear family 
and monogamy were an integral part of sapiens society tens of thousands uh, of, year ago, of years ago. Yes, they, they, they argue uh, the bands of hunter-gatherers 40,000 years ago, were, they were more communal than the ways that we live today. But even those bands, despite all the cooperation and all the shared food and shared effort, even, even they were uh, composed of these basic cells of a nuclear family composed of uh, two parents raising their children together, perhaps with some help from the neighbors, but uh, with the parents uh, playing the main role. So this is a huge argument, this argument about our sexuality, our family relations, our uh, uh, parental uh, system. In order to resolve the argument, the controversy, between those who believe in the primordial commune and those who believe that even tens of thousands of years ago humans and sapiens lived in uh, nuclear families and uh, raised children, just two parents raising their children. In order to resolve this controversy, we need to know something. We need to have some hard evidence about how, ancestor, how, about how our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago, actually lived. Unfortunately, there is few certainties regarding the living conditions of our forager ancestors. There is little evidence. And much of this very interesting debate between the ancient communist uh, school and the eternal monogamy school is based on, flims on very flimsy evidence. There is no written records from 40,000 years ago telling us how people lived and how families and communities looked like and whether they knew about fathers or they didn't know about fathers. The archaeological record is, there is some archaeological record, but the archaeological record consists mainly of some fossilized bones and stone tools. And this is hardly enough to reconstruct the rich life of people 20,000 or 40,000 years ago. Apart from the stone tools, we also have at our disposal some genetic evidence. Uh, we can learn all kinds of things about our ancestors and the ways that they lived by examining the genes in our bodies today, because these genes came to us from our ancestors. The last main source of information we have in order to understand the, the lives of the ancient hunter-gatherers is direct observation of modern, hun modern hunter-gatherers who survived in places such as uh, Australia or the Kalahari Desert until recent, recent times and in some places until even uh, this day. Uh, this is a very important source of information because we can observe the hunter-gatherer way of life directly but it is also quite problematic because it's uh, dangerous to assume that people who lived 40,000 40, years ago in, say, China or India lived in the same way as hunter-gatherers today live in the Kalahari Desert or in the Australian Desert. What makes it even more problematic to reconstruct the world of, uh, of people who lived 20,000 or 40,000 years ago is that it was not a single world or a unified world, but rather many different worlds. The most notable characteristic of hunter-gatherers hunter societies is how different they are uh, one from the other. People often imagine as if all hunter-gatherer societies have exactly the same basic social structure, the same beliefs, the same religions, the same values and norms. But this is a complete mistake. There is and was an amazing variety of social patterns, beliefs, values and norms among uh, different groups of hunter-gatherers. Prior to the agricultural revolution, it is estimated that the world, the entire world, was populated by about 5 million to 7 or 8 million uh, foragers, hunter-gatherers, and they were probably divided into thousands of separate tribes and bands each with its own language and culture and religion and behavior patterns. 
It's obvious that two groups who lived in completely different ecological zones probably uh, had different behavior. But even two groups living in the same area under similar, even identical ecological conditions might have had very different societies and cultures and beliefs. This, after all, was one of the main legacies of the cognitive revolution. Thanks to the appearance of fictive language, the ability to create imagined realities, even people with the same genetic makeup, who lived under similar ecological conditions, were still able to create very different imagined realities, which manifested themselves in different uh, norms and, and values and behavior. For example, there is every reason to believe that a forager band that lived, say, 30,000 years ago on the spot where Oxford University now stands would have, had, would have spoken a different language than a group living where Cambridge, Cambridge University, is now situated. One band might have been very belligerent and, and had a lot of violence. The other band may, might have been much more peaceful in its outlook and its behavior. Perhaps the band at Cambridge lived in a commune, whereas the, camp, the band at Oxford <coughs> was based on nuclear families. Perhaps the people at Cambridge might have spent long hours carving wooden statues of their guardian spirits, whereas in Oxford, people preferred, uh, were used to uh, worshipping uh, through dancing and singing. It's possible. Uh, the people at Cambridge may, might have believed in reincarnation and souls, whereas the people at Oxford thought that this was nonsense. In Cambridge, same-sex sexual relationships between men or between women might have been normative and acceptable, whereas in Oxford they might have been taboo. So there are many, many different, uh, many, many differences of, of this kind which might have existed between different human bands uh, prior to the agricultural revolution, even in the same area. This implies that the heated debates about what was the natural way of life of Homo sapiens miss the main point. The really important point is that ever since the cognitive revolution, there hasn't been a single natural way of life for sapiens. There have been only many cultural choices from among a very wide spectrum of possibilities. There are, however, some generalizations which we can probably make about all forager societies, despite all the differences, that probably did have some common characteristics. 